Warrior Within was an interesting experiment. From a gameplay perspective, it was largely a triumph, expanding on what worked in Sands of Time and attempting to revolutionize what had obvious flaws. However, tonally, it was an utter failure and almost everything aside from the gameplay at best didn't hurt, but never really elevated the game. So going into the third entry, you'd think that the team would go back to the drawing board and take the best aspects of both previous games rather than continue down a more divisive path. However, that wasn't originally the plan. Development for Two Thrones began immediately after Warrior Within in late 2004. However, in terms of story at least, the original plan was going to continue down the path that Warrior Within set and have the prince be much more mature in a similarly dark narrative as Prince of Persia, Kindred Blades. That focus was eventually shifted to what we got now, which had gameplay and a structure that was a mix of Sands of Time and Warrior Within, and on top of that had a much lighter tone, which, while still serious, could actually be taken seriously, you know? And it was a success too, it reviewed well, and the sales were apparently pretty good too, although we don't have the exact numbers. Two Thrones also released on PSP and Wii as Prince of Persia Rival Swords. I won't be covering that in detail as it's the exact same game, just on Wii or PSP, and kinda worse. We'll be taking a look at a good version today. So yeah, I'm really excited to play this. It seems like a lot of what Two Thrones did in 2005, ended up really popular and common later on, and whether or not it was direct, that sort of influence doesn't happen with too many missteps. I really hope I can walk away from this one with another favorite, so hey people, it's Scion Vise, and let's take a look at Prince of Persia, The Two Thrones. We start off with an opening cutscene where Kylina gives a recap as to what happened in Warrior Within. The Prince and Kylina are sailing towards Babylon when their ship is attacked and destroyed. The Prince washes ashore and sees Kylina being taken away by the invading soldiers, and the game begins. We aren't thrown directly into combat here, which is very much welcome after Warrior Within. The game gives some breathing room to let you relearn the controls and get your bearings. The prince can't attack or use any time powers at the start because he lost his sword in the attack, and just before that he stupidly decided to toss Farah's amulet overboard. The prince does feel smoother here, and I think a lot of that is due to a few things being quicker. The prince will jump up onto smaller ledges by walking towards it, which isn't a new feature, but it's so much snappier and responsive, and it feels a lot better because of that. So the prince chases after Kylina's captors, and eventually learns about who they are and what they're doing. The Maharaja's evil vizier from Sands of Time is still alive and kicking in this new timeline, and he's been busy. He still went looking for the Sands of Time, and when he couldn't find them due to the prince ensuring that Kylina was never turned into them, he made a backup plan. He learned that the Empress was needed for him to gain immortality, but was unable to find her, obviously. However, the Dagger of Time that he found gave him a vision of Babylon, and in order to make this vision come true, he overthrew the Maharaja and invaded. Upon learning all this, and wanting to do everything he could to save Kylina, the Prince rushes in and attempts to rescue her from the Vizier. But this plan fails. The prince is captured, and the vizier kills Kylina, unleashing the sands which he then uses to become immortal, while corrupting everything else around him. During this, the prince's arm gets damaged by a chain that had been wrapped around him, but he grabs the dagger of time from the vizier and escapes, saving him from being completely turned into sand. And this is where the game proper begins. I skipped over the majority of the tutorials in this opening section, but there have been a lot of really cool changes from Warrior Within. On the platforming side, the Prince doesn't actually have many new moves here, which is fine, but there are two new things that he can do while roaming the streets of Babylon. First, while running along walls, he can use these panels to jump at a diagonal forward rather than only being able to jump at a right angle. These are all in pretty obvious places and are largely just used for area traversal, so they aren't really used much for puzzle solving or combat. I kind of feel they're a bit underutilized, but they are still a nice addition. The second main addition is that the prince can use the dagger to latch onto grates in walls and hang from them. From there, he can basically do whatever he wants, jump up, drop down, jump away, or start wall running. 
This is the biggest addition in my opinion, and it adds a lot of new ways to get around in areas, and does so in a way that simply hasn't been possible before. And that's really it. Aside from just moving more smoothly in these two new additions, the Prince's actual platforming moveset is very similar to how it was in Warrior Within. And I'm glad. Warrior Within expanded on Saints of Time in a lot of cool ways, and Two Thrones is yet another step forward. The next big addition that the game introduces you to really changes how you'll be wanting to play the game. The speed kill mechanic. I don't know if you've played any game with stealth mechanics in the last 10 years or so, but if you have, you'll probably understand the general idea. When you get into a new area, all the enemies will be doing their standard patrols and they won't know you're there. So if you were to say, sneak up on a guy and try to stab him in the back, or perch on a high point where they can't see you, you'll be able to activate a speed kill. Like I said, this idea has become so common that it doesn't even need to be a stealth game to include it at this point. Yeah, it's a big part of games like Batman Arkham Asylum or Deus Ex Human Revolution, but it's also in games like The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. However, the implementation in Two Thrones is a bit more involved than those three. It's not just press a button to make the enemy go poof like in those games, this game utilizes another really common mechanic from the early 2000s for them, the quick time event. I generally don't like quick time events in most games as they don't really add much most of the time, but I like how they were included here for the most part. When you activate a speed kill, you'll need to time attacks between 1 and 5 times in order to successfully take out an enemy this way. 5 attacks seems like a lot for one enemy, but you're given a decent amount of time for each strike, so it's very likely to be your fault if you were to miss one. But if you do miss, you can remember that you're playing a Prince of Persia game, and use your trusty timey rewindy powers to go back before you messed up the prompt. On top of that, you'll be fighting a lot of the same guys throughout the game, so you'll have a lot of chances to figure out the proper timings for each one. To vary things up though, most enemies have two different animations with slightly different timings that you'll have to look out for, and if you've got enemies grouped up, you can even take out multiple at once. This is a bit trickier, but it's generally worth it if you can pull it off. Yeah, I really like this, it plays a lot into the franchise's strengths. It makes you rethink how you'll be dealing with enemy encounters. Sure, you could go in swinging, or you could jump around surveying the area, planning out the perfect way to take out each enemy. The proto-assassin's creed of this game is not subtle at all here, and to be honest, I'm completely fine with that. But that begs the question, what happens if you do mess up or choose to not use the speed kills? Well, then you're back to the sword combat, and... It's almost a one-to-one -one carbon copy of Warrior Within's combat system. Yeah, I was definitely disappointed when I started fighting and saw that the Prince behaved exactly like he did in Warrior Within. And yes, I was disappointed when I saw that almost all of the regular enemies were exactly the same as their Warrior Within counterparts, with a few small exceptions. And yes, I was very disappointed when the third boss of the game was just shoddy, but with one different move. So at a glance, you'd be likely to think that this game's combat is exactly the same as Warrior Within's, and that I didn't like it that much because of that. But actually no, while the majority of the core mechanics are the same, all the context surrounding them has changed, and that actually made me enjoy it quite a bit more. The why is a bit hard to explain, but I think it's a mix of having reason to fight enemies due to more forced sections, the ability to bypass it altogether with speed kills if you do things right, and the fact that the game actually teaches you how to do the Prince's moves and combos. Yeah, I have no idea why I didn't mention this during my Warrior Within review, but all you got was a combo list in the menus there, so if you never actively sought it out, you may not even know that the Prince had all these different combos and moves he could do. But Two Thrones fixed that in a very simple way. When you pick up a weapon, it shows one of the combos you can do with it on screen for a few seconds. So if I was in a fight, I'd see the combo, try it out a few times, and remember it for the future. That actually makes a huge difference, and combat is way more interesting and fun because of this. Almost all of the time powers from Warrior Within return as well, and are pretty much the same, with one missing being the big flurry attack. There's nothing really new, but the Wind and Cyclone of Fate attacks have been renamed, 
and this newly named Sandstorm is guaranteed to defeat all enemies you're fighting. Alright, so now's as good a time as ever to talk about the elephant in the room, the Dark Prince, because it was 2005 and every character had to have a dark counterpart. Uh, you're probably thinking that the Dark Prince is another reason for me to dislike the game because of how much I hated the edginess in Warrior Within. But no, actually, as a character, I think the Dark Prince is actually pretty fun, and his inclusion is another reason that I like the combat in Two Thrones a lot more than I did in Warrior Within. Due to the Prince's arm being damaged and corrupted by the chain, every once in a while he will transform into the Dark Prince and will stay that way until he comes in contact with water. A new form comes with new abilities and the Dark Prince's combat moveset is completely different from the Vanilla Prince. The Dark Prince uses a lot of the mechanics that the Sand Wraith did back in Warrior Within, but they do a lot more with him. Like the Sand Wraith, the Dark Prince constantly loses health, but unlike the Wraith, when you gather sand from enemies or the world, you will instantly heal to full, which reduces a lot of the stress in combat. He uses his signature chain in a lot of different ways, but in combat it gives him loads of new combos and big area of effect attacks. To balance this out, the Dark Prince's combat encounters generally have more enemies on him at once, so while you aren't likely to die from them, they're generally also a bit more involved. Having these two separate combat styles really livens up the experience in my opinion. The Dark Prince's larger hitboxes and higher enemy counts really nails the hack and slash combo combat a lot better than the regular Prince, whose combat is still just okay overall. But adding the stealth mechanic to bypass a lot of that gives the regular Prince his own unique feel and makes using them both fun and interesting in their own ways. That duality carries over to the level design as well, which again helps liven up the experience a lot. The overall structure is a lot closer to how Sands of Time was structured, being a series of linear levels, and despite liking Warrior Within's take, this is definitely how the series gets the most out of its gameplay. The Prince's parts should feel pretty familiar by this point, but I definitely think that the level design is the best of the bunch. It takes all the lessons learned from the last two games and really utilizes its level design well. The exploration is exciting, the levels are expansive, but it still feels like the areas are compact and filled to the brim with stuff, even if you don't necessarily need to use it, like the speed kill perches. And then there's the combat sections which do a decent job of changing up the pace. But even more so than Warrior Within, you're on top of tall buildings with large pitfalls around you, so the option to just grab enemies and toss them off the buildings is even more viable, which does undermine the viability of the combat a bit. As you travel, you'll find occasional forks in the road, and if you take the proper one, you'll be able to find this game's take on HP increasing challenges. I don't like these nearly as much as in Warrior Within, I have to say. They're missable like in Sands of Time, and overall the challenges just aren't as fun. They're much shorter and much easier. Even the late game ones were absolute cakewalks that lasted like 5 seconds. I almost wonder if they were super last minute additions, but the team just wasn't able to fully flesh them out in time. When the Dark Prince takes over, quite a few things change about the level design. Since his health is constantly dropping, his areas have to be quite a bit more segmented. There aren't really any super long gauntlets where you have to do a lot in one go. There's always spots to catch your breath or refill sand with combat. The Dark Prince controls differently too. His whip takes on the rope swinging from Warrior Within, and on top of that he can grapple off of hanging bars to swing to new areas. He can also pull on certain blocks to use them as platforms. And of course, there's a much larger focus on combat when the Dark Prince is in charge. His sections are overall pretty simple, and if the whole game was like this, I could definitely see myself getting a bit bored, but they're short and sweet, and as a change of pace, I really like them. You still get the more complex platforming and puzzles out of the regular Prince, whereas the Dark Prince has more breezy platforming, but really excels with having really nice and fun combat. It strikes a good balance in my opinion. Speaking of puzzles, they added quite a few here, and just like in Sands of Time, they involve a lot of lever pulling and block pushing, but that doesn't mean the puzzles are similar or even that simple. A few of them actually had me scratching my head for a few minutes, which is something that the puzzles in Sands of Time were never able to accomplish. Like, there's this one puzzle where you have to guide a giant statue through a warehouse of sorts, 
where there are lots of bits of the building that'll block the way if it's not facing the right direction. This took me way longer than I want to admit. Of course I figured it out eventually, but it was pretty tricky and I had a great time trying to solve it. Oh, I forgot to mention the bosses too, they're overall a huge improvement over Warrior Within's. In Warrior Within, they were basically just big dudes to hit with a sword until they died. None of them felt like they were using any of the game's strengths in any meaningful way. It was just use Eye of the Storm and press attack until they died. Bosses in Two Thrones generally use the Prince's acrobatic abilities a lot more. All but one of them have some sort of platforming aspect and just adding that makes them feel more like they belong in the world, you know what I mean? For instance, the first boss actually requires you to climb along the outside of the boss's arena and hit some speed kill attacks in order for you to even actually damage it. Obviously nothing is quite to the scale and size of say anything from Shadow of the Colossus, but it's a step in the right direction and this boss was the first in the series that I could actually call good. But there are only four bosses, one of which is a reskin of Warrior Within's Shoddy, and one is just a fight with two dudes, so I couldn't help but feel like they could have done a lot more with them. Maybe even a platforming focused boss, for instance a sand creature could be moving towards a lever that would kill a bunch of people and the prince has to beat the creature there and disable it. I'm just throwing out ideas, but I always want to see a game's core mechanics implemented in all aspects of it, bosses included. Adding to the breadth of new ideas here, there's even a few chariot sections where you're driving through the streets of Babylon, attacking enemies that get close to you, Final Fantasy VII style. These are actually pretty fun as well, but I kind of feel like they weren't used enough. This is the sort of thing that would have worked really well as a minigame, like the prince could have encountered an NPC who would have opened a path to an HP upgrade if the prince passed a chariot race without taking too much damage or that sort of thing. I get that the prince has things to do, but these sorts of minigames basically always distract from a more urgent plot, so I would have liked to see it. But yeah, after playing through this game twice for this review, I have to say that most of the changes were absolutely for the better. It plays smoother, the level design is more focused, while still being varied thanks to the addition of the Dark Prince, and I even had more fun with the combat thanks to all the additions that made it a less tedious experience. The presentation is another aspect that I'm a big fan of, and of course, it's largely due to the much stronger resemblance to Sands of Time over Warrior Within. The color palette is much brighter and the overall tone is a lot less edgy. For instance, when you killed an enemy in Warrior Within with a slash, the enemy would be cut in half or fall apart from the middle in a pretty gory way, but Two Thrones basically removed all of that. Any humans that you actually have to kill at the start just fall down and disappear, and even the sand monsters fall into sand rather than being chopped up into meat. It seems like a small change, but the prince turning monsters into dust feels a lot less extreme and violent than slicing living things in half. The fact that they deliberately made this change says to me that they realized how far they went with Warrior Within and rightfully course corrected. This lighter overall tone makes the game much more enjoyable in my opinion. The actual graphics themselves are a slight improvement over Warrior Within. Nothing about them blows me away, but it all does the job well. That is, except for one section near the very end of the game that made my jaw absolutely just drop. I'll save that for the story section though, since it is a pretty massive spoiler for the game's ending. The character models and faces are, again, a slight improvement overall, but I generally like the design changes. The prince's new white outfit again signifies that he's not as dark and angry as he once was, and it just looks pretty good too. I like Farrah's new design as well, it really sells her as more of a fighter than she was portrayed in Sands of Time as. Similarly, I overall like the looks of the environments and areas and do generally see it as an improvement. However, since the game takes place in just the city of Babylon, you're going to be seeing a lot of fairly samey looking buildings and palace halls. It's not a major problem or anything as there still is a decent amount of variety, but I kind of wish there was a bit more. The game's short development time definitely shows here, as you can see quite a few things that would have probably been ironed out had they been given more time, like textures that are just floating in the air rather than being properly placed on walls. When it comes to the music and sound, it's a 100% improvement over Warrior Within in basically every way. 
A lot of the actual sound design is the same as the previous games. It uses many of the same effects from Warrior Within and Sands of Time, but their general use and mixing is way better. Nothing stuck out to me as being too loud or too quiet or badly mixed in general, so that is great. The voice acting is overall a step up as well. The prince is voiced by Yuri Lowenthal again, thankfully, but he is the only actor to reprise his role. Farah, Kailina, and the Vizier are all voiced by different people, and while they're not bad, Farah's voice actress actually does a really good job. It's pretty noticeable when playing all of them back to back like this. Kailina's voice actress is playing the character way too softly and airy compared to the more confident performance in Warrior Within, and I don't think it works as well. Especially since she's the game's narrator, so we'll be hearing a lot of her throughout the game. The music is way better than it was in Warrior Within. I did enjoy what was there, but I would never say it was unique or interesting as a soundtrack. It was very standard guitar stuff, and it did largely step away from the more Arabian sounds of the first game. Stuart Chatwood and Inan Zur were both on composition duty this time around, and oh man, the results are awesome. This game's soundtrack really gets the best of both worlds. It takes Chatwood's Arabian melodies and mixes them with Inan Zur's impeccable orchestration and arrangements to create music that really fits the setting, the tone, and feels big, full, and for lack of a better term, epic. Some tracks do feel a bit more like film score than game music, but it's just overall so good. Picking my favorites this time around was a bit more difficult, but I think I've narrowed it down to Palace Battle, Besieged City and the game's ending theme, I Still Love You. It's such a harsh shift away from Warrior Within sound with almost no electric guitars at all for the majority of the game, and it really works well. I actually think this game's soundtrack is the best of the three. I don't know how blasphemous of a take that is, but I'm gonna stand by it regardless. Well, you know what time it is, it's time to talk about the story itself. So, as per usual, I'm gonna have a timestamp somewhere in the video, so if you want to skip it, you can absolutely do that. So, anyways. Here we go. Where we left off, Kailina was dusted and absorbed by the Vizier, who transformed himself basically into a god, and the prince barely survived the encounter with a heavily damaged arm. Despite this hardship, the prince is basically back to his old self, so he'd probably be talking to himself if he were making his way alone, but he isn't. The prince soon hears a voice inside his head which isn't his own, and this voice identifies himself as the prince's innermost desires come to life. Basically, he claims to be who the prince really is. The prince doesn't really buy it, but there's not a whole lot he can do about it, so he sets off to defeat the vizier once and for all, for killing Kailina, but more for ravaging his nation. I like the banter that the prince and the dark prince have throughout their journey. The prince tries really hard to be earnest and work to save his kingdom, but the Dark Prince's influence definitely takes its toll. He's basically the tiny devil on the prince's shoulder, but with no angel to balance it out. He starts focusing on killing the vizier more and more over saving his people. Eventually, the prince meets with Farah, who had been captured and taken to Babylon by the vizier's army. The prince knows who she is, but since the events of Sands of Time didn't happen, she doesn't know who he is. Eventually, they team up to find the Vizier together, and we get a bit of the same back and forth that they had in Sands of Time, which is nice. But the Dark Prince's influence begins to sour their relationship. Eventually, when the Prince and Farah hear people crying for help, the Prince chooses to focus on pursuing the Vizier rather than saving those people in need. 
Farah obviously doesn't approve of this choice and goes off on her own to save them. The prince eventually does change his mind, but the damage is done, and Farah doesn't really trust the prince anymore. I really like this dynamic. To the prince, Farah is someone he knew but hasn't seen in a long time, so he's not necessarily on his best behavior. But to Farah, the prince is just someone she's heard stories of over the years, and his actions, thanks to the Dark Prince, don't really match the picture painted of him. So it makes sense that she would get fed up with his selfishness really quickly, and uh, this doesn't necessarily make the situation much better. It was right of you to return- Prince? You- You're one of them? No, Farah! This is not how it appears! Yeah, the prince had been keeping his situation secret from her, so him being corrupted and transforming into a dark sand monster understandably scares and angers her and causes the two of them to split for a while. They do join forces again, but Farah never fully trusts the prince up until the final battle, and of course, while the prince is trying to make things right, the dark prince is pushing harder and harder for more influence. This all comes to a head when the Vizier captures Farah and knocks the prince down into a cavern, where the Dark Prince makes his final move to take control. The prince perseveres, however, and overcomes the Dark Prince's influence without water, which had been the only way to do so prior. The prince discovers the body of his father and his sword in this pit, which basically kills combat for the rest of the game. It's the sword that one hit KOs everything, and you can't get rid of it, so you're basically expected to just steamroll regular enemies from this point on. After the prince defeats the Dark Influence, this exchange happens. What is this? You have no water? How did you- You hold no power over me now. Be gone. Retreat to whatever dark hole spawned you, and do not trouble me again. But then immediately after that, during gameplay... Lead them into the light! Strike while they are blind! It would have been nice if the team actually coded away the Dark Prince's hints after this moment. It doesn't really hurt the story much, like, at all, but it's kind of funny and it makes the moment a little bit less impactful. The Prince finally makes his way to where the Vizier is holding Farah, and the final battle ensues. I think this is a pretty good boss, all things considered. It's a three-phase fight where you go from directly slicing at the Vizier, to speed killing parts of his body off, to a final platforming phase where you have to climb up debris to reach him for a final blow. It's good, if a little easy to cheese. Once the Vizier is defeated, Kylina emerges from him, absorbs all the sands back into herself, takes the Dagger of Time, and then leaves for another dimension which is safer for her to exist in. With the Empress of Time and all of her relics gone, except for Farah's amulet which is still at the bottom of the bay because the prince threw it at the start of the game and wasn't taken back by Kaelina at the end, the prince's journey is over, right? No. The Dark Prince is back and takes Babylon's crown for himself before the prince is able to, and the two of them start to fight and fall into the Mental Realm. Okay, this is the part of the game that blew me away. Everything about it is so cool. From the visual design, to the callbacks to the previous games, to the prince and the Dark Prince's conversation, it's like something straight out of Kingdom Hearts, seriously. In the Mental Realm, the Dark Prince insults the prince for throwing away the power to control time, and the prince retorts by saying that he no longer wants the power of time, and that he no longer follows the Dark Prince's ideals. When the prince reaches a room with two thrones, Farah appears and encourages him to leave rather than fight this battle against the Dark Prince. He does, and the Dark Prince vanishes forever. Of course, after all of this is finished, Farah wants to know how the prince knew who she was despite them never meeting before. And the game ends how the trilogy began. Most people think time is like a river that flows swift and sure in one direction. But I have seen the face of time, and I can tell you, they are wrong. Time is an ocean in a storm. You may wonder who I really am, and why I say this. Come, and I will tell you a tale like none you have ever heard. And that was Prince of Persia, The Two Thrones. Man, I, I love this game. Sure, I was never 100% sold on the regular prince's combat, and I doubt I ever will be. 
But just going back to the same platforming and exploration style of Sands of Time was a huge difference maker for me. I am way more likely to go back and play this one than I ever thought I would be even before making this video. And that ending section, it was so good! So good! There are a few extras you can get while playing, and it's pretty easy to get them. As you play, you'll find things called sand credits. You use these to unlock concept art for all three games, and that's pretty cool. But I don't understand why they used this system for it. I think it's supposed to be balanced around multiple playthroughs, but by the end of my first, I had unlocked everything. So why didn't they just have it all unlocked at the end? I don't know. You also get a cheat code when you clear the game for a special weapon, which is called the Telephone of Despair. And before you go thinking it's a regular weapon that got its name metaphorically or anything, no, it's just a telephone handset and it's not even that great of a weapon. Yeah, that's really dumb, but I love it. I miss when games had these sorts of cheat codes that would give you stupid anachronistic items or costumes, and I was really happy to see that this game had one of those. And I guess that's basically everything. I had a blast with this game, truly. If there was anything I would criticize it for, it's that it didn't take its new ideas far enough. For instance, the bosses started to use the platforming in their design, but it never went far enough that I was impressed with their use. But yeah, I absolutely recommend the Two Thrones. The balance of platforming and combat, along with the prince returning to a more likable personality, and the more overall palatable tone, it's really the whole package. I know this story isn't technically over, there's still Battles of Prince of Persia and the Forgotten Sands, but I'm gonna leave the spin-offs alone for a while and we're gonna take a look at the next game in the series chronologically, the reboot that probably didn't need to happen, Prince of Persia 2008. So I hope you like this video, uh, it took a long time due to things, but hey, thank you very much for watching and I will see you all later.